Well, I love sports. Our family, we're big sports fans. In fact, we've been going through this whole thing of like changing up cable companies and streaming and all this different stuff. And when you have conversations with the people on the other end of the phone of, well, okay, well, what kind of what kind of things do you really want and stuff? For us, it's always, what kind of sports channels do you got? We're big sports fans. I, I especially love team sports. I'm not a big individual sport fan. You know, the sports where it's just one person. The only time I really am into that is like the Olympics. But even, even that, uh, they're kind of representing their country. Uh, we're big Michigan football fans. We love to watch them. We're hoping to go and tour their stadium actually next month um, when we go uh, to visit family up in Michigan. Uh, we're big 49ers and Seahawks fan, kind of divided house between me and my son, you know, but he's going down this year. Um, of course, we're, we're Cubs fans. We're Chicago Cubs fans, the lovable losers. That's right, man. We do our best to, somebody's got to cheer for them. But I also love to watch my kids with their sports, their activities. My son, Brennan, he plays uh, soccer, plays for the Smithfield Soccer Club. Allie is a part of Studio 17 dance team. In fact, she had her last competition. I was telling people I was in, on Friday, I was in the land of hair glitter, and there was so much of it, man. Uh, she had her last competition um, in Virginia Beach on Friday, and uh, it's so cool to watch them. And th the thing I love to watch about, whether it's my kids in their sports and their activities, or if it's professional sports, the thing that I love to watch about it is how each person is just so different, and how they have different strengths and different weaknesses, and how, but within the team, they kind of bring those things together, and they're able to work together in this, in this unified way. And if their coaches really know what they're doing, they can really kind of capitalize on those strengths and even those weaknesses and put them together in such a way that it moves the team together um, and they all excel together. All of them working for a common purpose, a common goal. Yeah, but the thing is, is that even like I think of Allie's dance competition, and there were so many different groups that were dancing and stuff. And you watch and how even, even though they wanted all those groups to move together and be kind of, you know, kind of hitting their marks and hitting their spots at the different times and different ways together, they still kept their personalities. And you could see their faces and their different kids, the different uh, people that were part of it. Um, each one of them kept their personality, but were still working together. And I really think that's what this idea idea of unity is all about. And that's really what our focus is for this morning, is about unity. We're in this series that we're calling the Summer Mixtape. I don't know if you ever did a mixtape when, you know, years ago, kids, a tape was this plastic thing that you stuck into a machine and would play music for you. And if you were like me, you know, there were always like your favorite songs that you wanted to hear. Um, and maybe you didn't want to go through the whole album. And so you'd kind of get the double kind of take de tape deck and you'd transfer the song to the blank tape. And then it, later on, we did that with CDs or even sometimes you would do it with the radio. You would listen, you would record the songs off the radio and uh, be able to have these things. But you'd put together mixtapes uh, for the summertime, for when you go on family road trips, you could listen to your favorite songs because we didn't have streaming back then, right? So we had to kind of work to make sure we had our favorite songs there. And so what we're doing this summer is we're looking at several different uh, spots within the, books, uh, the book of Psalms to kind of pull out some different um, of these songs to kind of study and see what God has to say, with, say to us. Today's focus is going to be on Psalm 133. So if you have your Bibles and you want to go there, you can. We'll kind of read it in a moment. We'll have the text up on the screen as well. But the word psalm is really, it just really means a song of praise. It's, it's a song of sorts. It's, and, and there is a variety of songs within the book of Psalms. There are songs of lament and sorrow. There are songs of repentance. There are songs of celebration of God and his character and his goodness and what he's all about. There's even songs of thanksgiving. The psalm that we're going to look at today would be considered what they would call a wisdom psalm. And it's even labeled, if you're in your Bibles, you can see there's a kind of a label up above this psalm, and it's labeled as a song of ascent. Now, these were songs that people would actually sing to, as they traveled together on their way to Jerusalem. The whole reason that they would go to Jerusalem was because they were on their way to the temple, and the temple was up on what was called the Temple Mount. And so as they went up the Temple Mount to the temple, they would sing these songs of ascent. Now, the purpose of these songs, though, was not like just to pass the time, right? Because when we go on trips, we find things, part of the reason we have music is to kind of like pass the time, because the hours and hours that we spend in the car. It's like we need something to do to distract us. But that wasn't the point of these songs. When they would sing these songs, it wasn't to distract them or to pass the time. No, they had a real purpose. And we're going to see this morning the real powerful message that is within this song of ascent. Now, this psalm we're going to look at is just three verses. It's a small one, but it really, each, each of these different things, um, it has some powerful messages in there. 
And I wrote, this is kind of a good opportunity, too, to kind of point out that when we come to the book of, different books of the Bible and we come to the different chapters and different verses, those, those numbers, those chapters, they, they weren't there originally when it was written. That was kind of was added in later on for, for, by people who were a lot smarter than us to organize God's Word in a way that to help us kind of navigate it and manage it um, in, a, in a logical and meaningful way. And so when we come to this, it's actually one whole song. It's one whole psalm, but we're going to break it up into three different parts. So here in, in Psalm 133, in verse 1, in fact, I want you to read this along with me. Let's read verse 1 together. How good and please, pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. So this psalm, or this song, again, has three different parts, and we're going to look at each part of this. This is really focused on this whole idea of unity of God's people. David kind of makes these, this opening remark here about this idea of unity. In a second, we're going to see he uses even some illustrations and some word pictures to kind of describe what it's really all about. But I think the, the important thing that I want you to catch as we kind of start on this idea about unity is that unity is God's design, this is what God intends. This is how God wants things to be. He wants there to be unity. He even says that there's kind of like two parts to this plan. He, he said it's good and it's pleasant. Now, I want you to think about those words for a second and what they really mean for things to be good and pleasant. This word actually that's used for good here, if you go into the Hebrew, the original way that this was written, it's the same Hebrew word that was used to describe God's reaction to his creation. If we go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good. It was good. Over and over again, God would see the things that he had created, and he would say that it is good. Now, when God says it's good, I don't think God was meaning like, wow, I'm really impressive. I did a good job with creating all this stuff. I don't really think that's what God meant. I don't think he was in, impressed with his talents and his abilities. I think what it really is all about is it is God's way of saying, this is how it should be. This is what I intend for it to be. This is what it should be. And so when David says that God's people living in unity is good, again, I don't think he's like, oh, that's a really good thing. It's really impressive when people are able to pull that off. No, he's saying that's how it should be. Unity, God's people living together, working together in unity is how it should be. But he also said, not only is it good, he said it's pleasant. And this has to do more with like our experience of what it means to be in unity. If good had to do with what God intended, then pleasant is about what we experience and how we enjoy life and how God put things together so it will work in a proper way and how we experience it then. I mean, think about it, because it, it's true that when we, we as a people, as God's people, or even just people in general, when we get along together, then it's enjoyable, right? It's more enjoyable. I, like I mentioned about family trips. If you've ever been on a family trip, when everybody's enjoying each other, well, it's a whole lot more enjoyable. When things are pleasant and everybody's getting along and there's unity amongst the family, it's a lot easier to enjoy it. And here David is talking about the unity of God's people. And when we have unity, not only is it good and how God intended it, but man, we as Christians, we enjoy life a whole lot more. But you know what? I think even as Christians, even though unity is what God intended and planned for his, his people, his church, and even though it's a good thing, and even though it's an enjoyable thing when we have it, unfortunately, we tend to mess those things up, right? We tend to mess up the things that God has planned in a certain way. And I believe that the greatest enemy of unity within God's people is idolatry. Now, you may hear that, and you may think, well, that's a little heavy-handed, Joe. You really think it's idolatry? And what does that have to do with unity? And I don't think it's so much about like this idea of us building statues or participating in pagan rituals. But think about it, the things that kind of drive a wedge in between you and other groups of people sometimes. It can be things like preference. You know, if I don't like something 
if I don't think it's good or I don't prefer it a certain way, a lot of times it has to do with my preference. And if I don't, if I don't like things that way, then sometimes it, it pushes people to kind of raise a fuss or raise an issue about it. And really all it comes down to is their preference. And sometimes they'll even fight for those ways to be their way, all based on their preference. Or maybe it's not preference. Maybe for some people, it's more about tradition. And sometimes the tradition is kind of based on, becomes the, per, the preference, because I get so used to it. We've always, it's the old saying, right? Well, we've always done it that way, right? And so we get so used to it that after a while, our tradition becomes our preference. It makes me think of that, that old movie, Fiddler on the Roof, or the old musical. In that opening scene there, um, Tevya, he's talking about, you know, the, the, the town of Anatevka, and he's talking about all the traditions he has. He says this, he says, here in Anatevka, we have traditions for everything, how to sleep, how to eat, how to work, how to wear clothes. For instance, we always keep our heads covered and we always wear little prayer shawls. This shows our constant devotion to God. And you may ask, how did this tradition get started? I'll tell you, I don't know, but it's a tradition. And in that musical, the father, uh, Tev, Tevka, you know, or Tevia, he over and over again, his traditions are the things that kind of drive a wedge amongst his family and kind of tear them apart. His, his traditions and his preferences kind of supersede all the different things within his family. And we as individuals, we can allow the, we've always done it that way to rule us and even to drive us apart uh, from other people. But not only that, not only do I think it's, also, it's sometimes our preference or our tradition, sometimes, sometimes I th- even think things like fame can be the things that can drive a wedge in the unity of God's people. Now, you might think, well, I'm not going to become famous. I'm not worried about be- I'm any kind of fame. I'm not worried about that kind of stuff. But I think the kind of fame, I think fame kind of has like a sliding scale to it. Fame that we, it's the fame that we seek sometimes about recognition and being known and people looking up to us and respecting us and looking at us in a certain light. And sometimes that can drive us to do things to kind of chase after attention and chase after recognition And that really shouldn't be our goal. All of these things, whether it's our preference or our traditions or even seeking after fame, the real root of all these things, if we really look deep into it, it's all about self. It's all about putting those things, it's all about putting ourself in the place of God. It's about taking God off of his throne, out of his rightful place and putting those things or even ourself up into his place. And so instead, when God is in his rightful place, when God is where he belongs, when he's at the center of our lives, the center of our hearts, then we can really find real unity. Then it is good. It is as it's supposed to be. And it's pleasant. It's enjoyable for us. I mean, we can even see that throughout the Bible, there's different examples of those types of unity. Paul even talks about it in the New Testament. A couple different times, he uses the illustration of how our bodies work, or at least how our bodies are supposed to work, right? Like in Romans chapter 12, and verse 3, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Or in 1 Corinthians in chapter 12, It says, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they all were one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. And then if we jump to verse 27, now you are the body of Christ, and each of you is a part of it. You see, unity, us together, that is God's plan. That is God's design. But let's go back to our Psalm in 133 and see how David kind of describes this unity. He says in verse 2, It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robe. Now, we see several times, especially in the book of Psalms, and especially kind of throughout the different parts of the New Testament, sometimes there are things that the author will use like an illustration that maybe for the original readers, it's like it makes sense right away. But then for the rest of us, we kind of read it and we're like, say, what? Like, what is that all about? We kind of have to take some time and kind of peel back the layers there and really understand what's going on on there. And this is one of those times. He talks about this being like this oil and it's running down Aaron's beard and it's running down his robe. 
You know, we look at this through our 21st century eyes and we're like, what a mess. You know, I even saw some faces that some of you guys were making as I was talking about this. But if we were to, if we were to step back and we were to look at this through the eyes of a Jew in 1000 BC, I mean, it's totally different for them. Aaron was the first high priest. He was the first priest, and really throughout all of his family line, they were all to be the priests. They were all to be the representatives uh, from God to people and from people to God. And the way that the priests were kind of set apart and dedicated was that they were anointed with oil. This was a way of showing that they were specially marked and specially set apart from all the other people for God's work. And, and when they would typically do it, you know, sometimes there were different ways that they would do it for different times. A lot of times it might have been a small amount of oil poured on their head or maybe just like even a, a small dab of oil put on their forehead or different things like that. But here, the, the way it's described, the way that, that they would have read it in David's day, the people would have heard of this oil running down at this priest's head and on his beard and on his robe, and they would have thought, wow, what a... What a beautiful and powerful thing. It would be like God's blessings just flooding down on us. You see, unity brings God's blessings. It's the truth. When we are working together, forming together, kind of side by side as God intended, then it brings God's blessings. This word picture that, that David uses there, it kind of makes me think of Mary in the New Testament. In John chapter 12, we read of Mary and her, her worship to Jesus. It says this in verse 3, Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on, the feet, on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. This great sacrifice of what Mary did, man, it was meant not to be a mess, but it was meant to show her in, intense and overwhelming love for her Lord. And what David is saying here in this psalm is that when we have unity amongst God's people, God will pour out his blessing in such a great way, in such an overwhelming way that it would almost be like a, like a mess of blessings, just so much in our lives. When we are united in loving God and loving people and God's purposes, then we are in proper order and there is so much blessing in our life. But there's one more illustration he uses now in verse three, if we go back to Psalm 133. He says this, it is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Again, this is another one of those word pictures. We're like, who's Hermon? You know, what's up with the dew and all this stuff? And we hear this and we read it. And again, it may not mean much to us, but for them, when they would hear of Mount Hermon, Mount Hermon was this mountain range, this huge mountain range. And oftentimes it was known for the, the heavy dew that would fall on it during the warm months. And then even during the cold months, it was known for the heavy snowfalls that it would have. And, and, and you think about either the heavy dew coming down or even like when the months of, uh, of cold were over and that snow would begin to melt, and all that water would come down from that mountain range, that, that huge range and all that, and the life that it was bringing, the life that that water was giving to all the different regions around it. You see, not only do we find blessings in unity, you know, that's the whole like pleasant part, right, that we talked about earlier, but it also brings life to us because that's how God designed things to be. That's the, the good part. You see, unity brings life. And that's what Jesus was really all about. Jesus is all about bringing life to us. You see, Jesus was not about bringing rules or regulations or judgment or fear. In fact, it makes me think of what Jesus said. It's recorded in John 10:10. 10, 10. In the second half of that verse, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You see, that's, that's God's hope. That's his plan. That's his desire for there to be life. But again, when we don't follow God's plan, when we don't follow the way that God has designed things, well, then what we find is more of what's mentioned in the first half of this verse. If we back up to the first part of John 10, 10, Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And think about the number of times that the thief has come and stolen from God's people because of the bickering and fighting that we might have amongst ourselves. The way that, that the thief has killed God's plans for his people or destroyed the life that he wants for God's people. 
We see examples all throughout Scripture, even going back to Cain and Abel. They bring sacrifices to God. God is more pleased with Abel's sacrifices, Abel's sacrifice, and so Cain doesn't, you know, get the recognition that he wants so badly about it. And so, in his jealousy, he goes and he kills his brother. Or when Moses goes up on the mountain to receive instructions from God, he's gone for too long for God's people down there. And so they go and they build this this golden calf to worship because they don't want to wait on God. Or even jump to the book of Acts where people, God's people, the church, they're bringing all kinds of offerings and financial gifts to the church. It says they're selling possessions and goods and they're giving it to the apostles to then help people within that fellowship. And so this this, this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, they hear about all of that's going on. They're like, well, we want some attention too. And so they sell some property and they bring it to the apostles. They only bring part of that money, which is totally fine. But they tell the apostles, yep, that's all of it because they want the recognition too. And because of that, that God takes their life for their lie. You see, when there isn't unity, when we're making it all about ourselves and me, and when we pull apart God's plan, then it's not how God intended for us. It's not, it's not good. It's not as God meant. But even more than that, it's just not pleasant. We don't find the joy that God really has for us. We find that life that Jesus promised us missing. So how do we pursue unity? You know, if it's not all about us agreeing on everything, look, I got to tell you, we are never, no one is going to agree on everything right? I mean, if you're, if you're married, you know that. If you got a family, you know that. If you're like, if you have a heartbeat, you should know that, that we're not going to agree on everything. And it's sad to say that even within God's church, it seems like there are some times that we allow these things that we are so passionate about to be the things that drive a wedge, not only in just personal relationships, but sometimes we can allow those things to tear down a church family altogether in these selfish desires for preferences to be satisfied. And sometimes, you know, maybe we need to step back from that. You see, I really believe that unity is putting God first. Putting God first, having the same focus of God, putting Him on His throne, making Him the center of it all. And the thing is, is that if we all individually are doing that, if we all individually are making God the one who is the center and the focus, then together we'll all be unified because we'll all be heading in the same place. Not following after one person and their fame, their preferences or their tradition, but instead about being unified behind God. May that be our hope. Maybe that'd be our, our focus and our work. I mean, that's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things. He talked about all these things that you worry about. He says, and then all those things will be added to you as well. Or even Psalm 37 and verse four, David wrote there, he said, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You see, when you and I, when we as God's people, when we unify around God, when we focus on Him and we put Him on the throne, then we find that life is good, life is pleasant. So what about you and me? What are we doing personally about this? You know, how should, how should, because sometimes it's not always happening, but how should you be pursuing unity amongst God's people. In John's gospel, we read that one of the last things that Jesus did with his disciples, when he, he, before he headed to the cross, he prayed for the unity of his disciples. And in that moment, that must have been a powerful moment to hear their Lord pray for them in that way. But that not only included them, it included us as well, to live in that unity. And I really want us to catch that because I think sometimes we can forget about those kinds of things, that it wasn't just like Jesus prayed for their unity. And I think sometimes we think like, like, okay, so he prayed for the unity there. And then maybe he also, then that kind of like jumps amongst, jumps past everyone else within history and just lands on Smithfield Christian Church. Now his prayer was not only for his disciples to have unity, And I really believe that his prayer is not only for Smithfield Christian Church to have unity, but for all of God's people to have unity. That means, again, that we're not always going to all agree on everything. 
But that means that all followers of Christ at all time to be working towards the same thing. Look, you know, you can look around the town, you can look around Smithfield, you can look around the state, around the world, and you can see different churches that have different core tenets of their faith. You can see different churches with different practices of faith that, that you know, do things in different ways. In fact, a lot of times on Sunday mornings, either before I come up here or even as I'm kind of finishing some things up in my office, I'll have Facebook open and I'll have different churches services streaming there on my computer. And people do worship and, and study and fellowship in different ways. You know, Smithfield Christian Church church is not the only way of doing church. We have Harvest Fellowship Baptist Church or Trinity United Methodist Church or Smithfield Assemblies of God or Hope Presbyterian or Christ Episcopal. And the list could go on and on, even outside of our town of Smithfield. You see, friends, I I want us to recognize that even though we don't all agree on little different things. And again, this is kind of looking outside of our doors here. Even though we may not all agree on different things, they are not our enemies. They are not our competition. And we have got to find a way to not only love each other within these doors, but to love other God followers, other Christ followers in our community and beyond. We need to recognize that we are in this together. Unity starts with each one of us stepping back and I believe humbling ourselves and saying, you know what? I may not always have the right answers, And maybe someone else is doing this in a better way, maybe a a way that God would intend. But we're going to do our best to try and keep God on the throne and in the forefront of our hearts and our minds. And even if we disagree on things, we can still be unified. And we can recognize that there are things that we're still going to work on, even when we get them wrong, we're still going to move forward. Unity starts with each of us. Unity is God's plan. And so when you find another Christ follower, maybe, maybe at work tomorrow, maybe in your neighborhood, maybe at school in a few months when you guys start back up, or maybe amongst your family. What we need to do is not look for the ways that we are different. We need to celebrate the common bonds that we have with those other believers, the common bond that we just celebrated a minute ago of Jesus dying for us on the cross and raising to life to bring us a new life. You see, that is God's plan. That is good, the way it's supposed to be. That is pleasant, the joy we can have in life. May we make unity our goal and our focus. Let me pray for us. Lord, sometimes we can become very, very narrow focused. Sometimes we can, I don't know, I think in good intentions, Lord, we can do our best to want to focus in on us or me, and we can forget about the bigger picture. And I think your church, I I think the way that we approach your church is one of those times that we miss the bigger picture. Lord, I want to pray right now that you would, you would help us just right here at Smithville Christian Church. We'll start right here, God. We confess to you individually right now. We take this moment, we confess to you the times that maybe we have made it about me. And maybe, God, you can even, maybe you're prompting some folks right now in the different ways in their minds. Maybe your spirit is moving within them to kind of prompt them of some ways that they have made it about themselves and not about you, or maybe not about the bigger picture of what you've called us to. God, if we, if we see those moments in our hearts and our lives, would you, would you help us to run from those? Would you help us to step away from those, those preferences, those traditions that supersede you and take you out of your place? And instead, God, may within this church family, may we place you on the throne. But God, I pray that we could even step beyond this fellowship here, God. The times that we may drive past another church's building, or we may meet another person from another church family, and whether we physically do it or we do it in our heart and our mind, we turn our nose up at them as if we know better, and as if we have all the answers. God, we confess that sin to you as well. And we beg your forgiveness. Lord, may, may the unifying thing be you. And may in our efforts to try and worship you the best we can and serve you the best we can and bring others to you the best we can, may you give us humility to recognize that, that there are others working for the same thing. And God, as we find ways to work with others, may we not focus on the negative, may we not focus on the ways that we disagree, but help us to find those ways that we agree and that we pursue the same thing. Your glory, your honor, your kingdom come. 
We pray all this in Jesus' name.